Irene Anderson and John McMillan spend peaceful hours around their natural habitat pond. What's so different about that? Well, until recently, this pond was a swimming pool hunkered under live oak trees in Wimberley until Irene's son, Chris Smart, stepped in. One of the things that really impressed me when I was looking for properties was this swimming pool. And I thought, well, isn't that marvelous? I have these grandchildren. They can come and swim. And, um, and then it, it very quickly became a bit of a nightmare keeping the pool, <laughs> uh, dumping chemicals into it and keeping it clean. So I actually told my husband, John, that that we were gonna have to sell the place. And he said, why? And I said, I, I can't take the pool anymore. And he said, don't you think there's something else we could do besides <laughs> moving? I'm not quite sure who came up with the final idea of, well, let's make a pond out of it. Uh, since the real value of this pool was that this gigantic hole had already been dug in the... Hard limestone <laughs> hill country, you said, it's either a pond or we're filling it in, but I don't know how to do a pond. I said, guess what? I bet I do. Their mom and son plant and design collaboration came naturally since they operate Solstice Garden Expressions in Dripping Springs. Chris is the garden art designer. Irene runs the nursery geared to locally grown, drought-tough plants. In this family pond project, they got guidance from John's daughter, Sarah McMillan, and husband, Clinton Robertson, biologists for the Texas Parks and Wildlife River Studies Program. Luckily, we were dealing with a large pool with a deep end that was more seven to nine feet. I can't remember exactly, but it was a deep end. And that in and of itself gives you a lot of space to work with. At the deep end, they built an island to replicate a pond bank, supported by cinder blocks and metal framework. Underneath, the pump sits at the very bottom of the pool. To have good, clean water, it helps to set up your pump deeper than shallower. Tubing runs up through a rock for a natural-looking waterfall. And then there's actually the fish nesting area underneath that island, as well as where the pump is situated. In the shallow end, they also laid rocks and gravel, since the fish need gravel to lay their eggs. And then we have also more cinder blocks up there, so that the smaller fish can get away from the bigger Larger fish. fish. We wanted to establish the plants and the smaller what I, bait fish, a lot of people call them mosquito fish, the little minnows, get a good population of those and frogs first. And then about, we've got probably six to eight months into having it naturalized is when we um, introduced the native variety of local fish, the, the, the bluegill, the red-breasted sunfish. Chris and his kids went fishing and we, caught them with and a brought mission. them in with, the with mission. a mission and brought them with a bucket. That was a fun day. We made, we made cane poles because we knew we were not catching these fish for any other reason than to bring them here. So we wanted it, to do it gently. So we made our morning activity was making cane poles and then we went to a little stock pond that I happened to know and we caught a little variety of fish to bring over. By all accounts, it's been very successful. It started to naturalize almost overnight. We've created some other shallow points throughout the pond so that you can introduce some of the pretty water lilies and some of the water grasses and some of the mm -hmm. other fun water plants that make it come to life and look more natural. A lot of it has been a, a learning experience. The water plants, uh, the Louisiana irises, uh, I didn't know if they really would grow completely in water. Uh, same with the cannas, and yes, they do. The water lilies, I thought originally had to grow in a really quite shallow area, so we started them all at the, on the island, and they have migrated themselves out to the other end, and we can see when the water's clear that they're roots can go about five or six feet down. They improvised to merge water plants with the former pool's concrete surround. What we did was we used the rock to create above ground beds that look real natural all along the edge of the pond and then interspersed other native rocks to kind of soften the edge. The grandkids don't miss the swimming pool at all. 
even though they could take a dip in the pond, they're focused on wonder. The grandkids have actually spent a lot more time playing around this pool. They, they all have a little dip, dip nets, nets and, and a bucket. Well, a swimming pool is uh, pretty much a swimming pool day after day all year. A swimming pool is uh, something that you try to maintain in a steady state uh, so that it's usable anytime you want to, to swim. But the pond uh, evolves day by day, week by week, month by month. It changes with the seasons, and that is evident in the plant life around it, the plant life in the water, the, the animals that, that come there to, to partake of it or to, to live there, so that you really feel that you're in touch with nature when you come down here. Chris magnifies the experience with his mushroom art created with acid-stained concrete, recycled glass, and organic mounting. Each rendition appears to have popped up naturally, but these ones never disappear. This looks like a painting, but weather will never mar its acid-stained concrete. It gives you a year-round interest yeah. or color or something yeah. that pops. Most of the year, too, the family can hang out at the table Chris made. It's acid-stained concrete on a wrought iron base. And a lot of my work, I do use concrete and steel. It's kind of my preferred medium. To celebrate Irene and John's love of the pond's dragonflies, Chris designed a bench rendered by a fellow artist. The philosophical part of it was to create a, something that was as natural as possible. That, Promote life, not kill life. Yeah. I don't put anything in it, nothing. We have put absolutely nothing into this water. You weren't fighting nature, it was assimilating into nature and having the, the byproduct of that, or the, the, the beautiful thing is that you know when you see the birds, you know it's helping them, it's not hurting them. And when you see the red hawk that flies by, he's there because he's able to get the frog that loves the water because it can lay its eggs and it, you, you know that it's all working together and that the water is a source of life, not a threat. We come down at all hours. We have a lot of solar lights around the pond, and it's quite quite lovely at night. And we'll we'll sit out here and and just uh, talk quietly and listen to the water. And I, 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 every time I'm down here, I think, well, there's really not anywhere else in the world I'd rather be right now. Mm -hmm.